My name is Judy Bello, and I'll be chairing this uh, panel along with uh, Lucy Paguada. So I'm going to begin um, by uh, making a few announcements. The first announcement is essentially uh, for the speakers. Uh, We'd really, actually, my first announcement is to thank the uh, program committee and the conference coordinating committee uh, for all the work that they've done in preparing this event and uh, bringing together a really uh, exciting group of people from all different uh, venues of the social justice and anti-war movements. And I hope that we can all really get a new appreciation for uh, what one another are doing, because it's so important that uh, even if we're not at every event for every uh, instance, that we understand that we're all one and we're all working for a better world together. So uh, on that note, I'd also like to thank our speakers uh, who will be with you in a moment. And I want to say that um, we know that many of them, and many of you have come uh, long distances and at great personal expense to share your experiences and expertise. And we want you to know that it's very much appreciated. This panel is being live streamed and archived and will also be available later on YouTube. It's critical that we stay on schedule, something that is uh, becoming more critical by the minute. Um, we have packed a lot into these few days, and there are five plenary sessions, a tribunal, 31 breakout sessions, and more than 120 speakers. In order for things to move along smoothly, we're asking that each of you please keep to the time limit of no more than five to seven minutes. For those giving official greetings to the conference, it's three minutes, but uh, we'll have a timekeeper at each plenum who will hold up a sign when you have one minute left, and then a second sign when your time is up. If we all keep to the time kit limits, we'll be able to move on to the breakout session and the rest of the plenums on time. If not, the last speakers in the plenums may not be able to get there a lot of time. So I really encourage uh, our speakers to understand uh, that everyone needs to have their uh, opportunity to speak and that each of you will have further opportunities to speak after these plenums. Uh, so for my next announcement, um, I want to say that uh, we have some hashtags that you can use if you want to tweet about um, what's going on with this conference. One of them, the first one is No New Wars. Capital N, capital N, capital W. No new wars. And the next one is um, end war at home and abroad. End war at home and abroad with capital E, capital W for end war, and then capital H, capital A, home, abroad. End war at home and abroad. So if you want to tweet, uh, about the conference, or if some of the speakers has something exciting that you want to share, uh, those are the hashtags to use. And finally, the UNAC has a hashtag, and it's uh, UNAC1, all caps. So, uh, at the same time, although we strongly encourage you to tweet with your phone, we hope that you'll turn the ringers off so that our speakers aren't interrupted, because the time is short enough. So, as I'm here to welcome you, uh, this is on endless wars of imperialism. That's our topic this morning. And certainly, um, for the last 15 years, that's been ex in the 21st century, it's been very evident that we've moved from one war to the next with the United States uh, essentially facilitating and leveraging, if not fighting, in every single instance. Prior to that, um, we don't like to think about it, but the wars have gone on. The United States uh, began uh, with the genocide of the native population, the enslavement, 
of Africans brought over against their will, and the conquest of Latin America in the late 18th, uh, 19th and early 20th century, and of the, and the um, recovery of the uh, African and West Asian empires from the rest of Europe since World War II. Our country has not stopped aggression for one moment in this period. And we can uh, talk here about uh, just the 21st century. We could say, well, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, uh, Syria, uh, Yemen. And it just goes on and on, um, these wars of aggression, facilitated as well as fought by our country. And, we really uh, need to understand that this is the case, and uh, Ukraine, need me not forget, uh, and that all this agitation is uh, not only a horrific crime, but that it's an incredibly dangerous situation uh, for us, as well as the rest of the world. And I hope that by talking together here, that it will um, shore up our, um, our resilience and our, our willingness to come out and talk to the people outside of this group who uh, really have no idea and who, uh, you know, may not be terribly interested in hearing. Uh, one last comment. In 1946, my uncle, at the end of World War II, gave a speech in a mainstream venue uh, at, at a college, and he said, um, I think we should let the United Nations, we should work together for the United Nations to enforce international law and that all of the countries of the world should lay down their arms. And the United States being the most, the only country really at this point which is still in good condition and still has a strong army, we should lay down our arms first. And I think the fact that he could say that in a mainstream public venue and be applauded uh, tells you how times have changed. Because today, I think if someone went out and said that to a Republican or a Democrat convention to a college graduating class, they'd be laughed at. So we need to somehow regain our sense of perspective and our sense of how to have a society. And we need to talk to those people who have forgotten and lost track of what's really happening in the world. So I'm going to now um, pass your attention to my co-chair, Lucy Paguara. Thank you, compañera Judy. Buenos días. Good morning. Un anuncio, an announcement. Para las personas que solo hablan español, for the people who are here, compañeros who only speak Spanish, hay una mesa de traducción del inglés al español allá en aquella esquina. There is a translation a table from English to Spanish in that uh, very entry table. Así que pueden irse ahí, está la compañera Mónica y un equipo de traductores, la compañera Mónica and a team of uh, translators. It is a true honor to be here today at this incredible conference. And as Judy said, my name is Lucy Paguada, and I define myself as a Honduran in resistance. Soy una Hondureña en resistencia. Thank you. And of course, when we talk about the endless wars of the United States government globally, how can we not mention the endless war that the United States has held in Latin America? From the very beginning of the European brutal and ass assassin conquista or the invasion through the first European who landed in the Caribbean will be brutalized by the imperialist endless war. And shamefully later by our very own government of the United States. 
But we have to remember that when there is invasion and when there is occupation and brutality, there has to be resistance. So I'm also here to talk about resistance, the same resistance that you all are doing here in the United States. So an applause for you for being a resistance, just like the people in, in Latin America. How can we not talk about the resistance of Cuba? And el comandante Fidel, and el comandante Che, and today el comandante Raúl. How can we not talk about the resistance in Venezuela? And el comandante Hugo Chávez. Ecuador, Uruguay, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and of course Honduras, which a lot of times is forgotten. But we have to remember in 2009, when the brutal, brutal coup, US-led brutal coup, started the massacre of the Honduran people. But those people too, rise up and are still in resistance, and are still resisting the dominance of the US militarization of Honduras. So when we are here talking about the brutality of this government, we also have to talk about the courageous, incredible resistance of the people who are doing the work in their trincheras, just like we are doing here in the belly of the beast. So with that said, I want to welcome you all for, and I want to thank you for all that you are doing in your very own places, fighting against the injustices and the brutality of the capitalist imperialist system. And I want to welcome our first speaker. Her name is Susan Abulawa. Susan, please come to the front. Thank you. Susan Abulawa is a Palestinian novelist. She is a poet, activist, mother, and the founder of Playgrounds for Palestine, a children's NGO. Her debut novel, Mornings in Jenin, was an international bestseller, translated into 26 languages. Her second novel, The Blue Between a Sky and Water, will be published in June. Compañeros and compañeras, brothers and sisters, let's please give a very warm welcome to our compañera and sister in struggle, Susan Abulawa from Palestine. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here um, and for inviting me. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about this morning. Um, but I was telling my friend Betsy Piet about a story, something that happened to me recently, and um, she suggested I relay it to you, so um, I'm, I'm going to do that. Um, it involves uh, a, a, a popular mainstream show, I'm not going to mention what it is, but um, where uh, people are invited to give a sort of 15 minute talk that presents an idea or a concept or um, something provocative for people to think about and it should relate to also so personal stories and personal experiences. So I wrote a piece uh, that I was very proud of and um, I sent it to her uh, and, and it was an immediate refusal. So the topic um, that I had uh, written about involved, it, it was my reaction to this sort of pervasive um, uh, thing in Western discourse that demands of Arabs and Muslims to sort of uh, prove our humanity before we are allowed into the conversation. Um, so you see all these talk show hosts and, and interviewers who always end up asking us, well, do you support blah, 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 or do you support terrorism? And so this is, it's kind of this initial, this initial, you know, um, prove yourself, prove that you are worthy to be in our company kind of discourse. And, and it assumes sort of a, a moral superiority. And it, so the piece that I wrote was provoked by um, a particular letter that I received that was signed, um, sincerely, the, the civilized Western world. 
and yeah. <laughs> So, so I wrote a response. Um, I started with a personal story that I'm, um, I'm going to skip, but I do want to read you some of the relevant parts um, that the show uh, objected to, and they objected to it on the grounds that um, first, uh, this isn't something um, that you know the audience really is uh, going to be particularly happy to hear. That was the first thing when I you know, wrote back that I don't really think of the comfort of the audience when I'm articulating my truth. Um, the, the, the next response that came back was, well, it's not a particularly interesting idea and it's not very unique. Um, so I'm gonna read it to you and, uh, or at least part of it. And I, I framed it as a response letter. So it, it, there are phrases in there that uh, read, Dear Western World. Dear Western World. <laughs> You have laid waste to cities across continents, terrorized and traumatized whole societies. All are still recovering from your presence in their lands. I came into the world not long after southern poplar trees dangled lifeless black bodies, where entire white Christian families would come out by the thousands to watch and cheer the spectacle of lynchings. I was born toward the end of your foray into Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, the wholesale rape, wanton slaughter of innocents, and extraordinary destruction of the natural world. Following your colonial misadventures, you spared few post-colonial societies from your sense of entitlement to their resources, nor from your contempt and disrespect for their cultures. You allowed none of us to heal or develop our societies. Your endless coups, assassinations, covert and overt violence gave us no peace, no stability long enough to have our own social, scientific, cultural or economic revolutions. Anytime we liberated ourselves or elected nationalist leaders committed to the welfare of their people, you would kill, depose, and replace them with puppet autocrats who reigned terror on their people for your benefit. You did away with Thomas Sankara of Burkina Faso because he advocated for self-sufficiency that threatened your hegemony in the region. You murdered Patrice Lumumba and with him, the chance that the people of DR Congo might share the riches of their own land. Then you sent your corporations, your miners, militias, and missionaries to oversee the bloodletting of six million Congolese. You martyred Salvador Allende and plunged Chile into torture and misery under your man, Pinochet. You tried your best to kill Fidel. You tried, and maybe you succeeded in killing Hugo Chavez and Yasser Arafat. You did away with Mohammed Mossadegh too, because he insisted that Iranian oil was for the Iranian people, not you. Then you propped up the Shah to do your bidding. The Sykes-Picot agreement was one you made in secret to divide, manipulate, and rob us in perpetuity. And when it was uncovered by the Bolsheviks, you remained unrepentant, adamant that Arab and Persian oil was there to flow cheaply to you. When the first elected leader of an independent Syria, President Shukri Qawtari advocated for Arab unity and self-determination, you backed a coup to take him out, fledgling that Arab democracy in Syria in ways that reverberate and echo into the unbearable carnage that is Syria today. Osama bin Laden was your man. Saddam Hussein was your man too. You ushered him to power after you got rid of Abdul Karim Qasim, who dared to put Iraqi interests before yours. You brought Saddam to power through an orgy of killing of Iraq's intellectuals, teachers, doctors, scientists, poets, and musicians. When I was a little girl, I lived in Kuwait in an area populated with Palestinian refugees like us and poor workers from other Arab nations. In the apartment across the hall from us lived an Iraqi widow with her children. Kamal, her oldest son, was 18 years old. I was six, and I expressed my little girl crush on him by throwing fruit peels and mango seeds at him from our window when he walked by. Everyone knew what I was up to, of course, because timing my insults required a great deal of reconnaissance and planning. But he was so good-natured about it. Kamal's life, his dreams, and future ended when he was killed in the Iran-Iraq war. You cynically armed both sides of that awful conflict switching sides back and forth to ensure that neither got the upper hand for long enough so that the fighting and inhumanity would, would continue as long as possible. Kamal was one of an estimated one million who perished in the fog of that war. When your local lord Saddam Hussein became too powerful and Iraqi society perhaps too educated, you engineered a, a way to plunge them all into an incomprehensible hell. 
Your sadistic sanctions alone killed 500,000 Iraqi babies under the age of five. Some of the ones that survived your barbarity are the rank and file of ISIS now. They are the ones who grew up without education because you bombed their schools, roads, and bridges. The ones who drank the water you polluted when you systematically destroyed their water system. The ones who nursed on the depleted uranium you spread throughout their land. The ones who grew up under the thumbs of your soldiers whose merciless cruelty you are still hiding. What we saw of Abu Ghraib we know is just the tip of the iceberg. You made ISIS. ISIS is your Frankenstein, not Islam's. They are your monsters that you unleashed into our tortured cities, into societies too broken now to perform the normal functions of marginalizing extreme elements. And we still do not know how ISIS is so well trained and so well armed. You destroyed Iraq. You reduced that ancient society, that birthplace of written language and mathematics into a cauldron of internecine violence. You looted their museums and oil fields. You did the same thing to Libya. You made beggars of mothers and teachers and doctors and produced generations of illiterates into what were high-functioning cultured societies. I'm going to skip the next personal memory, but I could go on of what you've done, and of course, what you've made of Palestine, that once multicultural, multi-religious, multi-ethnic land is now a place of exclusivity, supremacy, and entitlement for Jews at the terrible expense of non-Jews. A place of apartheid, multi-tiered laws based on religion, color-coded IDs, segregated roads and buses, of military occupation, guard towers, snipers, sweeping surveillance, systematic state theft, constant displacement, persistent day and night raids that drag people from their jobs and schools into torture dungeons. Palestine is the birth and life place of my ancient Jerusalem family, centuries of inhabiting at Tur, and centuries more before that of inhabiting Deir el Hawa in Jerusalem. But none of us is allowed to live there or inherit our birthright because in the eyes of those who hold the guns, we are the wrong kind of human. We are exiled, occupied, or languishing in refugee camps so that every Jewish person from around the world can have an extra country. The devastation you have wrought and on others is breathtaking. When refugees of the infernos you stoked managed to escape, grasping at the wind for some lifeline, you let them get swallowed by the sea. Or if you let them in, you congratulate yourselves endlessly for your charity, consign them to impoverishment, and simultaneously bemoan an immigrant problem. When you had destroyed, stripped, and raped so many of everything in this world, and they had nothing but their faith to give them a modicum of solace, you openly and publicly mocked what is sacred and holy to them, ascribed the most vile filth to their prophet, and in an inconceivable arrogance you called it free speech. The Penn American Center even called it courageous. Dear Western world, I think I should end. I'm getting um, the end now, but I want to thank you all for listening to me. Thank you. Johnny is a Syrian-American peace activist and a founding member of Arab Americans for Syria, which is essentially a West Coast organization. He has been to Syria seven times since the present crisis began in 2011, and he led a U.S. anti-war fact-finding delegation to Syria in September of 2013 at the height of the U.S. campaign to carry out a military strike. Um, I remember that they went and interviewed the youth who were uh, sitting outside the area that the U.S. had uh, threatened uh, to strike. So uh, I hope Johnny can come up here. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you'll be interested in what he has to say. Good morning. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, 
as been told, the founding member of Arab Americans for Syria, a group that we started together early on in the crisis when we realized what we were up against. We realized what's happening in Syria is not a revolution, far away from being a revolution. We realized they were trying to manufacture a revolution. We felt how the media, the vicious media campaign against Syria, not that just they're not presenting the other side of the story, but on the contrary, they were reversing the facts. Everything that was showing early on was nothing but the opposite of what's happening. Syrians have seen what happened in Iraq, we've lived it. We've seen what just had happened in Libya months earlier. We didn't want the same to happen to Syria. Syria was living its best days at the time. Yes, we wanted reforms, we supported reform. People were going in the millions in the street and in support of the government reforms. Yet the media was only showing you the few hundreds that wanted to overthrow this government. They were the puppets for the United States to turn out Syria from being a resistive nation to a puppet nation. I will just very briefly tell you what um, uh, the, um, the, what's his name? Uh, uh, Turkish General Ismail Haki, he summarized it by saying, he's the chief of staff of the Turkish army. He said, Turkey has repeatedly asked Syria upon request from the West and Washington to let the Muslim Brotherhood into the government when Assad refused. They moved to the armed rebellion, importing armed groups, mercenaries, and terrorists from all over the world to overthrow Assad by force. The Turkish and the Qataris wanted to pass the gas lines from Turkey to uh, from Iraq, uh, Qatar to Turkey. When Syria refused, of course, all hell was broken loose. Um, Qatar and Saudi Arabia provided the propaganda early on. On Qatari TV, we heard a call for jihad. Uh, we heard it in the mosques uh, just before, on Friday prayers, people asking for jihad. Jihad is a very difficult word, very dangerous word, people. When on Qatari TV, which had earned the trust of the Arabic viewers through the Palestinian crisis, we, when you hear in your home calling for Muslims around the world to come to Syria to fight the infidels, all Syrians have become infidels. Anybody who supports the Syrian government is an infidel. So what happened to democracy? Don't I have the right to fight or be on the side who I want to be? Suddenly, we were getting threats. All the Syrians' blood were spilled. If you were with the Syrian government, your blood is halal. Uh, Qatari um, uh, Yusuf Qadawi, the head of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, not only provided the necessary fatwa, which is a religious decree for fighters to come into Syria, but he also asked them to join the Islamic State and to start the Sharia law in Syria. This is was the most dangerous thing that the West never reported. We were fighting mercenaries from all over the world. The Syrian army was not attacking civilians. The Syrian army was protecting cities. Any place that these mercenaries did not come in is still intact. Damascus, which is the most cosmopolitan of all the cities in Syria, has a mosaic of all religions and different ethnic groups and sectarians. It's, it's, it's safe, they protect each other. There is no civil war in Syria, otherwise Damascus should have been lit on fire. On the contrary, Damascus, where five million live, the only problem in Damascus is our friends, what the Obama administration called moderate rebels. They're the ones who rain Damascus every single day for now almost two and a half years with rocket propelled grenades. This is the only thing that's happening in Damascus. No one talks about it. It's the most consistent thing in this war is this rocket propelled grenade. We've lost families from these random rockets. How is not that terror? These are the moderate troubles that Obama wants to bring in instead of the secular government that we currently have in Syria. These people who have promised us that once they get in power, they're gonna slaughter us. The only thing that's preventing them from doing so is the Syrian army. The Syrian army, if it falls, if it drops, then you'll have a true genocide in Syria. You will have, if you think 100 or 200,000 have lost their lives, most of it by the Syrian army, you will have millions. You will have a true genocide in Syria. So I'm trying to tell you, these mercenaries have committed all the crimes you've heard about. I don't have time to discuss and prove to you. But all the massacres that happened on the eve of United Nations Security Council meeting, how convenient on every eve of uh, United Nations Security Council meeting we have a massacre. The US, the Syrian army was convicted and then the ambassadors closed their embassies and Syria was punished. Uh, you know, sanctions, and then, you know, your guilty party, and then this is not the pretext for war. We fought this off. Thank you to all of you. What happened in, in, in Ghouta, this bomb attack, we know who Sarin it was, right? 
So thanks to you, millions of emails, millions of phone calls hit the Congress. And I think this is the first time when the American public was able to stop a war for the first time ever. Thank you. We moved on. They needed to find another pretext. The next pretext was, of course, the global war on terror. Bush used it. He was never tried for it, right? A million Iraqi killed, 40,000 American families' life dismantled by either losing their son or daughters or, or bringing them home. We're done. Oh, man. There was so much I have to tell you, but thank you. Maybe later on we'll finish. So, I just want to follow up on what Johnny just said and say, please, please read outside of the mainstream press on Syria, outside of the channels supporting U.S. policy, because everything that you hear there is, as he said, the opposite of the truth. So, uh, for now, uh, we're going to move on and we're going to hear from uh, Joel Andrews. Joel uh, is coming up now, and he has uh, he uh, works for workers' rights and racial justice, and he's written a wonderful uh, comic book uh, called Addicted to War, which I hope all of you will take a look at. Thank you. Well, thank you, and I'd like to thank Sarah and Joe for inviting me to come here. Uh, this is a great event. Um, I want to start with a proposition, and that is that uh, sometime in the future, aerial bombardment is going to be considered a war crime. It's going to be banned by international convention. Uh, it's going to be considered beyond the pale. Um, and that's because I'm not just talking about napalm or white phosphorus or carpet bombardment or all the other extremely, especially horrendous aspects of aerial bombardment. I'm talking about all aerial bombardment with conventional bombs, with any kind of bombs, of villages, of cities, because they kill so many civilians. Uh, this is the main reason why in the 20th century the deaths of civilians during wars has increased, has just skyrocketed. It's because of aerial bombardment. That's the key reason. Um, now, when, it first, when they st first started dropping bombs on villages and cities from airplanes, this was during the First World War and after the First World War. It was very, very controversial. This changed during the Second World War when it became normal. You could say it became normalized, and by that I don't mean it was supported by lots of different specific conventions. I mean that it became, it was looked upon as normal. During the Second World War, it changed. Um, and then it became even more normal with the Korean War, with the Vietnam War, and more recently with the Gulf War, with the Afghan War, with the Iraq War. It's become a regular part of U.S. military strategy. In fact, it's become the central part of U.S. military strategy around the world. And by now, it's, it's, it's looked upon as normal by uh, politicians, by the mainstream media, by diplomats, uh, by mainstream human rights organizations. All of them see this is just a part of war. Uh, of course, when Syria drops barrel bombs, uh, it's, it's called a war crime. And it is a war crime. But when the United States drops much more powerful bombs and kills many more people, or when France does, it's just looked at as a normal part of war. But this is really the main reason why so many civilians are dying in wars in the 20th and 21st century. Now, I don't know whether it'll happen in our lifetime, but it's going to happen that this is going to be looked at as a war crime and it's going to be banned. Now, how does something like this become, something, something so barbaric, become normal? I think we can see this process happening today with drone warfare. Um, there's three major innovations with drone warfare. One is that the attacking party does not have to send their own soldiers into war, so they don't have to risk their lives. And they don't have to stir up the kind of opposition that that causes. The second is that it's an endless war, that it has no boundaries, that it has no boundaries in terms of time, there's no beginning, there's no end, and there's no borders. And it's justified, it, it's, it, I guess those are two reasons. It has no borders, it has no boundaries, and it has no uh, beginning and end. This is justified, it's been justified in several ways. It's been justified by the war on terror, um, which is, they suggest we have to wage war constantly with no end. 
It's also been justified by comparison with conventional aerial bombardment. They say, and this is true, that bombing with drones causes less civilian casualties than bombing with jets and, and bombers. Um, that's true, but it can only be looked at as uh, less civilian casualties when you compare it to the absolute uh, huge amounts of civilian casualties that are caused by bombers and, and, and jet fighters. Um, and it's only because those have become looked at as normal that then drones can be looked at as less um, barbaric. Now the big question today is how can we keep drone warfare and this kind of endless warfare from becoming normal? Uh -oh. <laughs> um, and I think that uh, it's certainly possible to do this. Um, we've, we've got to work extremely hard to keep it from becoming normal and then if it does become normal, because I don't think there's any um, there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to keep it from becoming normal. We've got to constantly uh, still fight against it and until it, we can drive it be from becoming normal um, altogether in the future. Now that's certainly possible. Uh, one time in this country plantation slavery was normal. Uh, there were people who opposed it at first. There were people who opposed it all the way through. For decades abolitionists opposed it. Uh, finally they succeeded. Uh, we might be seeing the same thing happening right now with something else. With on police murders with police brutality. I live in Baltimore and for the last uh, several weeks there's been really remarkable protests. Some peaceful, some violent. But constant protests against the killing of Freddie Gray. And it's had a, a tremendous effect. I think before the Baltimore police have killed people regularly. Young black men, young unarmed black men regularly for years. And it's not only in Baltimore, it's all around the country, and this was normal. It didn't even rate headlines. Uh, since Ferguson, that's changed. And now it's changed even further. Uh, with uh, Ferguson, they did not indict the police. In Baltimore, they indicted them, charged them with second-degree murder and manslaughter. And the police may be losing their impunity. And it's because people saw that this was not something that we should acquiesce to and consider as this normal. I think the lesson is that there were people that were fighting abolition of slavery for a long time, that were fighting uh, for against police brutality for a long time. They never gave up. Uh, we have to have the same attitude towards aerial bombardment. We have to have the same attitude towards um, drone warfare and endless warfare. And uh, we have to keep it from becoming normal. And if they are succeed in making it normal, we have to keep on fighting until we uh, make it barbaric again and not normal. Thank you. So, uh, in the midst of our confusion, um, I wanted to announce, uh, just to announce that um, this is Joel's book, Addicted to War, and um, Joel has agreed to donate to the conference uh, the profits, He's, this book is on sale in the lobby, and all of the profits will be uh, donated to support this conference and the social justice issues that we stand for at this most, so I'd like you to applaud this most generous um, donation. And I'd also like you to buy a copy of the book because it's really quite fun, I like it. And uh, you know, when you're done with it, your teenager might even look at it. I'm definitely getting a copy of that book for my 10 year old son. I would like to, rec to uh, recognize the presence of the members of the May 1st Coalition's uh, participation in this conference, if they can get up and um, can we give them an applaud. As you can see, please, May 1st Coalition members, please stand up. As you can see, most of them are women. It's really interesting how this coalition is um, led by incredible, courageous women and men, most of us women. That's to say that without the women's participation, there is no revolution. Power to the women. Thank you. Our next speaker is Abayomi As Asikiwe. He is the editor. Thank you, Abayomi, you can start coming. 
He is the editor of the Pan African News Wire, based in Detroit. He is an organizer with the Michigan Emergency Committee Against War and Injustice, Mekawi, and the Moratorium Now Coalition. Please let's welcome Abayomi Asikiwe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And uh, the topic of this uh, panel this morning, Endless Imperial Wars, is a very broad topic. And I want to, of course, uh, deal uh, with the origins of modern day imperialism over the last six centuries. And I have exactly six minutes to cover 600 years of world history. <laughs> so I'm going to get started right now. In order to fully understand uh, the current period of imperialist rule uh, throughout Africa, Asia, Latin America, and within the geographic boundaries of the European continent and North America, we must acknowledge, uh, first of all, the role of the 15th century interventions in Africa and in other parts of the world. Beginning in 1402, the Kingdom of Castiles a precursor to modern-day Spain, invaded the territories off the coast of North Africa, uh, now known as the Canary Islands. This period in Southern European history represented the initiation of an expansion into Africa and Latin America, stemming from an alliance between the mercantilists and the monarchies of both Spain and Portugal. Now this intervention uh, into the North African islands of the Mediterranean was met with fierce resistance for nearly a century. It was not until 1495 that the rulers of Spain could claim control over the Canaries. The role of Portugal in taking control of the other islands, such as the Azores and the Cape Verde, set the stage for the expansion of the Atlantic slave trade, the colonization of South America, Central America, and the Caribbean islands, as well as the encroachment into North America. Within the Canary Islands, as early as the latter years of the 15th century, a pattern of colonialism was established that will continue until the contemporary era. After the conquest, the Castilians imposed an economic model based on single crop production for export, first utilizing sugarcane and later wine, which was an important item of trade with Great Britain. During this period, the first exploitative structures of a colonial regime were established. Both Gran Canaria, a colony of Castile uh, since March the 6th of 1480, and Tenerife, a Spanish colony uh, since 1495, had separate governors, connoting the soon to be universal system of divide and rule. Through, through the conquering of the African islands, the system of the Atlantic slave trade would flourish through the 19th century, when the European rulers imposed the colonial system based on an increasing industrialized method of production and labor exploitation. By this time, most of Africa had been conquered by Europe, with the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885 served to provide additional legal cover for the institutionalization of colonial rule, which was just as genocidal and socially disruptive as the system of slavery. The Atlantic slave trade and colonialism was a violent system of exploitation, which brought other European countries into the process. After the initiation by Spain and Portugal, many other burgeoning nation states in Europe became involved, including Holland, Denmark, Germany, Italy, Britain, and France. This project did not remain limited to Africa and the Western Hemisphere, but extended eastward to, today, to today's Middle East and the Pacific Islands. Both World war, war Wars of the first uh, half of the 20th century were largely based on the struggle between various European states. The waning Ottoman Empire, which collapsed uh, during World War I, and Japan, 
and a ruthless campaign to conquer the world and its resources. The national liberation movements which emerged forcefully uh, during and after World War II would reshape international politics. With the emergence of newly independent states throughout Latin America earlier during the 19th century and within, within Africa and many parts of the Caribbean and the Asian Pacific after 1945, the imperialists developed a system of neocolonialism where control was maintained through economic and military means despite the granting of political independence. And I'll end right there, <laughs> but thank you so much. How's everyone feeling? I don't hear you too clearly. How's everyone feeling? Yeah, remember that we are being live streamed, so we want to make sure the world knows that we're having a great time while we do the struggle. Because our struggle is also about feeling good because we are in resistance against our enemy. Yes? Thank you. Our next speaker is also a member of the coordinating committee of the May 1st Coalition. It is Bernadette Elorin. Bernadette Elorin is the current chairperson of Bayan USA, an anti-imperialist and democratic alliance of the Filipino organizations across the U.S., representing youth, women, workers, LGBT, cultural workers, and human rights activists. Bayan USA is the oldest and largest overseas chapter of Bayan Philippines, the main political center of the anti-imperialist movements in the Philippines. Let's welcome Bernadette Ellering, my sister in strong. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, before I talk about the Philippines and the Asia Pacific region, I want to start by thanking and acknowledging uh, the people of Ferguson and the people of Baltimore for reminding us that we are living under a police state. And as such, when we talk about endless wars, that resistance is not a choice. Resistance is a way of life. So that being said, I think the challenge for us as an anti-imperialist movement in the U.S. is how do we support struggles for self-determination? How do we support struggles of people's resistance? Not just in name, but also in form and method. Um, okay, now I'm gonna go into the Philippines. Um, so, in very broad strokes, uh, the Philippines was the first site of the first U.S. war of aggression when, when, the, when the U.S. became an imperial power back in the turn of the 20th century. And ever since then, it's been one of the original laboratories for U.S. counterinsurgency, along with um, Latin America. But I'm not even going to focus on the Philippines. I'm going to focus on one island in the Philippines and one part of that island, and the island is Mindanao, and the part of Mindanao is Muslim Mindanao. Um, I'm not sure if you heard, but earlier this year, there was a massacre in a town in Muslim Mindanao called Mamasapano. And the, the details of this operation, it was a botched counter-terrorism operation to apprehend and neutralize two wanted terrorists um, who had bounties on their head. Uh, members of, um, they were basically Indonesian jihadists, um, Marwan and Usman. They were being, uh, they were located in Mama Sapano at the time. They were being, uh, the, the narrative is that they were being supported by the uh, MILF or the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And so what happened in January was that uh, a big operation of Philippine police, special action forces of the Philippine police were deployed, not unbeknownst to the Philippine military to apprehend, um, to apprehend these two individuals who were hiding out in Mama Sapano. What happened was the president himself directed this operation, and the top brass of the Philippine military didn't know anything about it. So when it all fell apart and all of these people died, including members of the Philippine National Police and members of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, and supposedly Marwan, one of the two uh, terrorists who were targeted, um, there was a lot of uh, uh, anomalies. And 
It turns out, after much investigation, the president was getting his orders directly from the U.S. military. Um, that were, were stationed in that region. The, actually, the U.S. has a drone center in Muslim Mindanao. And they were getting their, their, their directives from the U.S. military personnel embedded in Camp Navarro, which is in Zamboanga City. So this speaks to the extent of how covert and extensive U.S. counterinsurgency is, not only in Mindanao, but all over the world. And we have to recognize it as a form of war, a form of warfare, a form of low-intensity warfare, just like the police here are an instrument of low-intensity warfare here in the U.S. Um, that being said, um, back in uh, last year, uh, Biden USA organized a peace mission uh, to Mindanao where we were able to talk and have dialogue with a number of uh, Bangsa Moral armed revolutionary groups about the struggle for self-determination in Mindanao. And, well, since the, for 116 years, the Bangsa Moral people, which are a repressed national minority, have been waging an armed struggle against U.S. imperialism, not just against, not just against U.S. imperialism, but also against the chauvinist, U.S.-backed Filipino government. Um, and what we learned is that the U.S. has been relentless in embarking on a pacification campaign, calling it a peace process, when in fact it's a pacification and divide and conquer campaign. And what we learned is that um, that thankfully the Bangsa Mora people have not abandoned the desire to wage armed struggle, even though in the midst of U.S. counterinsurgency, in the midst of pacification campaign, they are still taking up arms. So I think the challenge for us as a U.S. anti-war, anti-imperialist movement is how do we promote a counter-narrative that actually sees these people not as armed terrorist groups or bandit groups, but as freedom fighters. That's our responsibility. That is our responsibility to promote a counter-narrative of these armed groups as freedom fighters. And this is at the crux of our, our essence as an anti-war movement. And my time is up. Thank you very much. Our brothers and sisters in the Philippines say, Imperialismo in Yes? yes? Alright. Imperialismo in Baksa. Imperialismo in Thank you. Gracias. Um, Jacqueline A. Di Salvo, if you are in the audience, you are asked to please report and stop by registration. Jacqueline A. Di Salvo. <laughs> We're doing commercials too, announcements, everything. Our next speaker is Glenn Ford. He is the... Glenn? He is the executive editor of Black Agenda Report, the weekly Black Left magazine of news, commentary, and analysis, which he co-founded in 2006 with Bruce Dixon and Margaret Kimberly. A lifelong activist, Ford has worked as a broadcast and print journalist since 1970. He is the author of The Big Lie, analysis of U.S. press coverage of the Grenada invasion. Glenn Ford, Black Agenda. Please, let's welcome Glenn Ford. Thank you. How to the people. When you've got seven minutes, you've got to decide whether you're going to focus on a particular aspect of the subject at hand or do an overview. So I'm going to do an overview, a brief one, on endless imperial wars. Now it is, of course, true that the period that we've entered is one of ever escalating aggression by the U.S. superpower and by its junior partners. They're wreaking sheer havoc and spreading untold terror upon the world. They're waging multiple wars simultaneously in what can only be described as an assault on civilization itself. So it, it does feel, it does feel that in this 
juncture in history that these imperial wars will be endless. However, they will end. They will end with the defeat and the destruction of U.S. imperialism and not before that. Ending U.S. imperialism and ending the wars is the same thing. You can't talk about one without the other. It's important, therefore, that we assess the health of U.S. imperialism. And if we do that, we will see that it is not in good health. In fact, it is in fatal decline. The Lord's of capital, and that's the class that this imperial machinery has been designed to protect. The lords of capital are also acutely aware that they are in decline globally. This is a class that creates nothing but seeks to dominate the productive capacity of the entire world, and that is the contradiction. And what they cannot dominate, they destroy, or they put under imminent threat of destruction, a kind of global coercion and extortion. They are doing a lot of destroying these days because their hold on the world is slipping, and it is slipping everywhere. They no longer even make a pretense a pretense of trying to compete with the rising centers of the actual production of things in the world, or places like China and elsewhere. Instead, what they do is they try to blackmail and terrorize the planet. They try to rig and extort profits through their sole surviving advantage in the world, and that is their military power. Ultimately, even that military power cannot save them from their cascading and multiplying fatal contradictions. These are contradictions of the system itself. They have plunged the world into what seems like endless wars, a deliberately imposed kind of chaos, and they have done that because they have no other choice. So we shouldn't be intimidated, and we shouldn't be demoralized, and we shouldn't be oh, thrown into some kind of inaction and paralysis uh, because of the shock and awe of US imperialism's vast criminality. They are ferocious these days because they know full well that the position of the European former colonial powers and of the United States is untenable. It is untenable in the long term and it is untenable even in the shorter term. Anybody, anybody who can count can see that the productive capacity of humanity is growing beyond the control of the U.S. empire, and that becomes their crisis. The very growth of the productive capacity of the world causes a crisis for U.S. imperialism that cannot dominate it and control it. Therefore, U.S. imperialism wages various types of warfare to thwart the growing trade and connectivity of the world's peoples and the world's economies outside of imperial control and manipulation. That's why it pivots to the Pacific to present a military face to China. That's why it sponsors Nazis in the Ukraine uh, to create a war in Europe in order to destabilize and stop the integration of Europe and Russia. They have no other choice but to resist this connectivity, to resist the furtherance of civilization itself. These wars are not going to be endless. They are only as permanent 
as the U.S. imperial system. A commitment to peace means a commitment to finishing off imperialism. UNAC has that commitment. They're in it for the long haul. Power to the people. Good morning. Neo neocons have successfully taken over both mainstream political parties in Washington. Obama's administration is infested with the likes of Secretary of War Ashton Carter, who wants confrontation with Russia and preventive war against North Korea, and Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland, who's anti-Russian and was instrumental in toppling Ukraine's elected president just over a year ago. The neocons are reigniting Cold War hysteria. Anyone in the West that speaks out against this provocative U.S.-NATO chaos plan is Putinized in a classic replay of 1950s style red baiting. Right after the U.S.-NATO sponsored coup d'etat in Kiev, the neo-Nazis were sent to take similar control of Crimea after their chaotic Maidan split the country and initiated civil war. Neo-Nazi death squads have now been given official status inside of Kiev's military. This means they're getting training from U.S. Army, from the U.S. Army who are now in Western Ukraine. So what's the plan? Continue to expand U.S. NATO bases up to the Russian border, including Ukraine. Deploy so-called missile defense systems that are key elements in Pentagon first strike attack planning. From eastern Ukraine, U.S. cruise missiles could reach beyond the Urals, where Russia's main nuclear forces are located. By 2020, when the current phase of NATO missile defense will be fully implemented, the missile defense shield, taking out Russia's retaliatory capability, could be used after the U.S. NATO first strike sword is thrust into the heart of Russia. Russia has an aging early satellite warning system and keeps its nuclear forces on launch on warning status. Thus, the chance of accidental nuclear war increases. Forget any negotiations on reductions of nuclear weapons. Russia and China repeatedly warn the U.S that deployments of missile defense have killed nuclear disarmament talks. The overall strategy recently spelled out in a Chicago speech by George Friedman of Stratfor is to destabilize the Putin government internally and externally, which would create chaos and lead to regime change in Moscow. One significant method of external destabilization is the European Reassurance Initiative signed by Obama at the cost of $985 million. These monies are for Pentagon projects that include airfield infrastructure and improvements for U.S. NATO warplanes in Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Romania. In February, U.S. military vehicles paraded 300 yards from the Russian border in Estonia. Narva, Estonia sits 100 kilometers from St. Petersburg. In March, the battles between Ukrainian army and pro-Russian self-defense forces in the east 
had largely stopped and heavy weaponry was being pulled back, the Minsk II ceasefire was then holding. At the same moment, U.S. General Philip Breedlove, the top NATO commander in Europe, spoke to the media in Washington. Putin, Breedlove said, had once again upped the ante in eastern Ukraine by sending in Russian troops. Der Spiegel reported that German leaders in Berlin were stunned. They didn't understand what Breedlove was talking about. The German government, supported by intelligence gathered from their own sources, did not share Breedlove's irrational view. The U.S. military capacity building near the Russian border illustrates the game of hardball that Washington and Brussels are playing. They are putting a loaded gun to Putin's head. The threat is being made to either submit or face ex expanded war and chaos, similar to what the, uh, the U.S. and NATO have unleashed in uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and beyond. Last weekend, more than 5,000 brave citizens in Kiev protested the U.S.-backed regime's crackdown on protest leaders and journalists, many who have been killed in the last month. Organizers of the protest were arrested, were reportedly arrested following the, the march. The U.S.-NATO proxy war in Ukraine is a trigger for a full-scale war with Russia. In the past, the peace movement has supported self-defense forces in places like El Salvador and Nicaragua. We should be doing the same today in eastern Ukraine. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, speaking of Ukraine, our next speaker is Irina Koval, who has come from Odessa, Ukraine, to speak with us. And her speech will be translated by Helena Makrusha, who came here also with some tribulation from uh, Quebec. <coughs> So uh, let's welcome them and uh, hear the story of Ukraine from someone who's there. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we and my friend, me, me and my friends, come uh, here from Ukraine. Uh, В нашей стране сейчас идет война, и она приобретает ужасные формы. There is a war going on in our, in our country and it takes on uh, atrocious forms. Когда агрессия людей приобретает самые низменные выражения. When aggression of people takes really vile expressions, vile forms. Желание убить доминирует над разумом и нормальными человеческими чувствами. The desire to kill uh, prevails over reason and normal human feelings. Человека могут забить палками или сжечь. A person can be uh, beaten to death by sticks or can be uh, set on fire. Это значит, что наше общество деградировало настолько, что ценность человеческой жизни уничтожена. It means that our society has degraded to the point that the human life has no value. И от того, что это делается массово и поощряется государственной машиной, это разрушает наше понимание мироустройства. Чужое мнение ничтожно, и права человека массово попираются. Somebody else's opinion does not count at all, and uh, permissiveness uh, and, uh, sorry, and human rights are violated on a massive scale. Ганения, аресты, обыски и политические убийства – это наша сегодняшняя реальность. 
So the persecutions, the uh, arrests, the... Um, The political killings and persecutions, like I said, and arrests uh, are encouraged and they... Um, okay. And it means also that those who are doing it uh, believe that they can do whatever they want without being punished for what they are doing. В нашей стране uh, набирает силу фашистский режим. A fascist regime is taking shape in our country. И все это делают люди, которые не чужие друг другу, uh, и которые просто искусственно разделены пропагандой. And all of this has been done by people who are not alien to each other, they just artificially divided by state propaganda. Делают это ради денег и алчности своих правителей. And they are doing it for money and for greed of people who command them, for their masters. I and many Irina and many of her educated friends are just are shocked by this. They cannot comprehend what, how is it possible. Мы видим, что в Украине сейчас происходит то же, что и во многих других странах, с которыми мы солидарны. And we see that what we're witnessing in Ukraine has been happening in other countries uh, with which we express our solidarity. So the, the, the same processes that we now witness in Ukraine have been taking place in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, in Palestine, in Iraq, in Algeria. In Egypt, in former Yugoslavia, in Venezuela, Ecuador, in other countries. Мы все жертвы империалистической войны. We are all victims of the wars of imperialism. Для нас важно объединиться и быть солидарными в своих действиях против ужасов этой войны. So we we believe it's very important for all of us to unite and uh, be. Uh, in solidarity in our actions against this um, terrible war. And we should say loudly so that the whole world hears us, we should say stop. We don't want war and we don't want killings. We don't want uh, weapons being uh, delivered to our country. Thank you. McGovern. Most of you uh, know Ray from other events. Uh, he is a former Army Infantry Intelligence Officer and a CIA analyst, having served under seven presidents and nine CIA directors. He was one of the senior analysts who prepared and briefed the President's daily brief. He also chaired the developments of the National Intelligence Estimates. His website is raymcgovern.com, and uh, so here he is to, uh, I'm sure, give us uh, some insight into this event. Thank you for inviting me. This one. Uh, today is uh, Victory in Europe Day. Exactly. Exactly 70 years ago today was the German surrender. We drove the Nazis back out of Europe and they surrendered. And when I say we, I mean the Russians first and foremost, and then we. The parade uh, before the Kremlin has just ended as we speak here. And uh, the reaction of our president was to be a no-show. 
a supreme indignity, a supreme insult to the country that turned back the Nazis at Stalingrad and sacrificed twice as many people killed, 27 million. Can you count them? 27 million, okay? Twice as much as all the other countries involved, including Germany. A supreme insult. Why? Because the puppeteers that are taking care of our puppet, President Obama, and he should be on this, on this same uh, shirt, um, uh, they, uh, they, don't want, uh, they don't want peace, they want confrontation. Peace, after all, as many of you know, is bad for business. It's especially bad for the military, industrial, corporate, congressional, security services, media complex, of which I reminded us. So let me say a little bit about uh, World War II here. I'm quoting from James Douglas's monumental work on the JFK assassination. It's in his introduction, and he's quoting Thomas Merton. Not very long. I first wrote to Thomas Merton in 1961 at, at his monastery after reading a poem he had published in The Catholic Worker. Merton's poem was spoken by the commandant of a Nazi death camp. It was titled, quote, chant to be used in processions around a site with furnaces, end quote. Merton's chant proceeded matter-of-factly through the speaker's daily routine of genocide to these concluding lines, quote, do not think yourselves better because you burn up friends and enemies with long-range missiles, he would have added, drones. Because you burn up your friends and enemies with long-range missiles without ever seeing what you have done. Do not think yourselves better. And we talk about the greatest generation. What shall we call our generation? Now, I was going to uh, quote from, uh, uh, from that wonderful uh, Harry, who is it, uh, what's her name? The, uh, the creator of Mother's Day, the Mother's Day Declaration, Julia Ward Howe. I will repeat just one of the sentences there. Our son shall not be taken from us to unlearn all that we have been able to teach them of charity of mercy and of patience. I was in Moscow two weeks ago, invited to celebrate the meeting on the Elbe, where Soviet forces and American forces finally joined two weeks before the end of the war. I was asked to speak, and so I chose to, to, to recite a poem. And I'd like to recite it for you here, and then translate it very quickly. The poem is called Heeding the horrors of war, horrors being ujus, ujus. It's almost onomatopoeia, isn't it? Vnimaya ujusum vaini, prikajde novu zhertfu boje, nežal, ne druga, ne žene, ne žal, ne sama pikororje, uvi učešice žena, i druga, lučji drug zabudit, a gdje te je stuša adna, a nada groba pomnit budit. Pre lice mjernih naši štjel i vsakoj pošlosti i prozi, a dnje je v miri podsmatrel svjetije, iskrenje slozi, to slozi bjednih materijej. Im ne zabudit svoji štičej, pa gibšit na kravavo in ne vje, Kak ne podnjat plhuža ivi svojih paniknuših vidvi. It means alone in the world are sacred, sacred sincere tears. Those are the tears of poor mothers. They don't forget their children that perish on the bloody battlefield just as a weeping willow tree can, can never straighten out or lift its branches. 
by the Russian poet Nikrasov, who is called Payet uh, Ruskoy Skorby, the poem, the, the poet of Russian grief. I'll, I'll end now by simply saying that that poem came to mind 40 years after college when Cindy Sheehan in Dallas said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to Crawford to ask the president what, what honorable cause my son was killed in. And my colleagues in Veterans for Peace, Code Pink, others said, we're with you, Cindy, we'll go. I was there with the fire ants, and I was asked to speak. And what could I say? I recited that poem. So in closing, I'll simply say this, that uh, there's a long tradition of honorable, gutsy, enlightened, and very well-educated women. Uh, there's Harriet Tubman, there's Fannie Lou Hamer, there's Anna Edwards that you'll be hearing from in just a minute. She's chair of the Sacred Ground Historical Reclamation Project in Richmond. They weren't going to build a stadium on the sacred place where so many African Americans were sold into slavery. So Anna prevented that together with her husband, Phil, who's up next. Actually, I'm so proud to be male like Phil because every now and then you'd get a male with the courage of his spouse. So Phil's next. Thank you very much for listening. Power to the people. You are an amazing audience. We are doing an extraordinary time. I have a couple of announcements. Do not forget to hashtag No New Wars and UNAC1 hashtag. Also, uh, make sure that you let people know that they can listen to us at cprmetro.org, and they can see us. Yes, stood up for the media, alternative media. You know the corporate media and their lives, so we need to promote our own media. <laughs> and it is it is being video streamed by going to proradio.com. And we want to make sure we get a copy of the addicted to war. Don't forget that it's only ten dollars. It's a great investment. And you get to have the author's autograph. How much do we want to get for ten dollars? Come on now, that's important, right? We are having our final speaker for this session, and after our final speaker, my compañera, my sister Judy, will give some final announcements and final words. But before we get to our last speaker. I would also like to share something very brief about me, besides um, defining myself as a Honduran in resistance, I also define myself as a socialist. También soy socialista. And so we say, down with imperialism. Down with imperialism. Y en español, Muerte al imperialismo. Muerte al imperialismo. Muerte al imperialismo. Long live socialism. Viva el socialismo. Y si se puede. Thank you. It's been an honor being here with you today. You inspire me. I've learned so much. You're wonderful. And a un aplauso para ustedes. An applause to all of you who are here today. Thank you. Our last speaker. <laughs> Only for the morning. Because in the afternoon we have so much more phenomenal um, conferences. So sorry. Phil Willalto. 
He is a longtime anti-war and, and community activist and editor of the Virginia Defender, a statewide quarterly newspaper. He is a co-founder of the Virginia People's Assembly for Jobs, Peace, and Justice, author of the In Defense of Iran, notes from, from a U.S. peace delegation's journey through the Islamic Republic, and a member of this conference organizing committee. Thank you so much for being with us. Let's welcome you, Phil Guilato. Phil Guilato. I gotta have a right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I actually, it originally was Beleshka, but uh, when it came out the other side of Ellis Island, it was Waleto. So. <laughs> um, Ray McGovern so graciously mentioned the struggle in Richmond, Virginia around Shaco Bottle, um, which is not the topic of, of my talk, but it will be the topic of a workshop uh, reclaiming the landscapes of black history that Anna Edwards will be leading. Um, and that is about a struggle uh, that to reclaim and properly memorialize the area in Richmond, Virginia called Chaco Bottom that at one time was the fountainhead of the U.S. domestic slave trade and an area from where the majority of African Americans today could trace some history. It's also the area target for a commercial baseball stadium for a second string minor baseball league. Uh, by the local developers who want to make a lot of money there and don't give a rat's tail about history. Um, and it's a good segue to my talk because that struggle is a fight for the right of the black community to self-determination, <clears throat> to determine its own destiny, to define its own history, and chart its own future. And that's the same principle, one of the founding principles of the United National Anti-War Coalition that we base our analysis of the relationship between the United States and oppressed countries around the world, including the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, I don't think I'm gonna be able to squeeze my whole talk into the seven minutes, and I don't wanna be another older white guy who insists that his words are so golden that they must be extended. So, I'm going to tell you that I've distilled the talk down from a, a piece that we have in the spring issue of the Virginia Defender newspaper, uh, which is available in the Defender's literature stand, along with a lot of material about Shaco Bottom, and also our book, In Defense of Iran, Notes from a U.S. Peace Delegation's Journey Through the Islamic Republic, all proceeds of which go to support our all-volunteer newspaper. Having used up half my time, I will now make a few remarks about the, the topic that I'm addressing, which is the nuclear talks between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, the United States, uh, the UK, France, Russia, and China, plus Germany, which gets to take part in the talks because after all, it's Germany. And so they're called the G5 plus one countries. And the, the talks are a little bit off the back burner because the impression I think people have is that they, they're sort of went fairly well and there's going to be some kind of a reconciliation and the West may be getting to lift some of the sanctions against Iran. Um, and that may not be true. But I don't want to go into the details of the treaty and what's all involved and the technical aspects and so on, but I would like to point to a few things that are not being discussed very much in, in the headlines and, and the news media accounts about it. One is that the United States is reluctantly taking part in these talks. There has been unrelenting hostility against Iran since its popular revolution in 1979 kicked out the U.S. puppet Shah and the Iranian people took back control of their natural resources, particularly oil, uh, which was a tremendous blow to uh, U.S. control in the area, and then emerged as a regional power, not so much in terms of military might, as the U.S. bases its power on, but its influence. 
and standing up as Cuba has stood up and showing that you can defy the empire. Iran is not a socialist country. Uh, it uh, has a lot of internal contradictions, but it is really nothing like we have been told it is here in this country. They have a vigorous political life. They have contested elections. Women can vote, drive, run for public office, which they cannot do in Saudi Arabia, the United States' closest ally in the region. And it hasn't fought a war in over 200 years where the United States hasn't been at peace in over 200 years. And although every one of the G5 countries, except uh, the G5 countries, the permanent members of the Security Council, has nuclear arsenals, they're making the center point of the talk with Iran that Iran cannot develop a nuclear weapon. It, don't I get a minute? Yeah, yeah. Warning? Instead of that doing was, that, just talk. Oh, you're no, but if I'm up, I'll, I'll, I'll get down and I want to leave. Was that seven minutes? Okay, all right. The United States, the Obama administration is being forced to negotiate with Iran because Iran is the one that is stopping the extremist elements, ISIS and the Islamic State in, uh, in Iraq. And it's backing off from its confrontation in order to try to get that situation settled and then can come back and oppress Iran. The neocons in Washington who have never accepted the fact that there is a black man in the previously all-white house are opposing it because the only control that they can see the U.S. exerting is direct military control, where the Obama administration would like to control indirectly through coalitions and sanctions, short of, of war if it can do that, but is just as willing to do that. Now, to finish the rest of this talk, now I've left you on the, on the edge of suspense and how, how this, these events will flow out. Please come to our workshop uh, this afternoon on Iran, the nuclear talks, Iran's influence in the Middle East, and uh, the Tehran Peace Museum, which you may have heard of, since you have not heard of anything called the United States Peace Museum, you might be interested in the Tehran Peace Museum. And finally, I just want to thank Dair Rashid from the Defenders and Anna Edwards and all the good folks who came up with us from Norfolk and, and, and uh, in North Carolina. Dair Rashid to raise up people, black workers for justice, nation of gods and earth. Well, I hope you have a variety of tasks here at this conference and we really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, folks. Um, so I just have a few, we're, at, we're, at, we're down to housekeeping here. Few announcements to make. Um, first of all, just to get it out of the way, somebody left this lovely bracelet in the ladies' room. Um, next, um, be, you're going to a breakout session of workshops from here. The rooms are named as jewels. Hopefully, you have a piece of paper that looks like this, and it will tell you what what room to go to for your workshop. Most of the rooms are upstairs on the next floor up. So, except for the crystal room. The crystal room is over behind Java's in the library. Uh, I mean in the lobby, oh Lord. In the lobby. So, um, please go pick a workshop and go directly there. After the workshops. I still have. Oh, okay. I'll get Thank there. You. I almost forgot something. Who could know? Um, okay, and so um, we have Kaylee Knowles before, actually, before we break out. Uh, before I give you Kaylee, though, I'm going to uh, give you uh, an idea of what to do about lunch. After the workshops, there will be lunch, and during lunch, they'll be showing films in this room, uh, short films by various uh, people in this, uh, or various organizations represented here. Uh, lunch is available at noon in the hotel. Uh, they have a buffet for $13.95. You can go to the place sandwich kiosk for seven or eight dollars. Or there's a deli at the end of the street if you want to eat a little more cheaply, normal food. Okay, so that's lunch. And be sure to come back at one o'clock because one o'clock is when our next panel begins. And I don't see Katie. Katie, are you there? Come on. Um, I have, I almost forgot you, but I didn't. Um, Kaylee is going to talk to you for a moment about the journal. So please stay, uh, this is your beautiful source of information, and I think, uh, 
You want to hear what she has to say. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be real brief because I know everyone wants to get to their breakout sessions. Uh, I'm Kaylee Knowles. I think about half the people in this room have gotten a nagging phone call from me. Uh, so now I have a face to put to that. Um, <laughs> I'm an organizer with People's Power Assemblies in New York City. <laughs> uh, thanks, Amari. <laughs> and uh, I, I was the lead coordinator on this program journal. <laughs> Uh, first, I would just like to say I'm so excited and honored to be here with you all today, strengthening and building our struggle, struggles both nationally and internationally. Um, if you hadn't had a chance to look at this yet, this is where you can find the schedule, the breakout sections, um, the speaker bios are in here. There are a few really amazing articles written by members of UNAC. Um, and there's also a form if your organization would like to join UNAC that you can fill out and return to us. Um, but in particular, I would like to highlight that in the back of the journal, there are solidarity greetings um, from a bunch of organizations who help contribute to make this conference possible. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, a conference like this takes the contributions of hundreds of individuals and groups um, to make it a reality. Um, some of those con contributions are financial, some are people volunteering dozens if not hundreds of hours of their time and resources all to bring us all together. Um, so I really do hope people will take the time to look through that and, and see some of the organizations that help make this possible. Um, because their financial contributions um, did help us make this conference financially accessible and ensure that no one would be turned away for lack of funds um, to really keep this available to young people, to working people, um, to lower income people. Um, and in particular, I would really especially like to thank um, four groups um, who took out um, full page greetings. Um, the, the Muslim Peace Coalition, the Parliament of the World's Religions, Alice Walker, and the Syrian American Forum. Thank you all so much. And I wish I had time to thank the other hundreds of people who contributed, but we would be here till dinner and no one wants that. Uh, so I would just like to end by saying thank you, thank you, thank you all so very much. And I look forward to learning from and building with you all, not only this weekend, but beyond. Thank you. Thank you.